welcome to Digital Photo Mentor and my first Facebook Live. I'm really excited that you are here. And today I'm going to be answering a few questions from the poll that I submit. Uh, several of you sent in questions about photography and some of them are, are random. I've got questions from all over the world. So really great that you all sent in your questions. If you could just comment if you're joining in live, where you're joining from, your city and your country. I'd love to see where you're all joining in from. I see Daniel from Miami. Hello Daniel. Daniel is our Morocco tour leader. Nice to see you. And I see Rob from Canada, Edmonton. Hopefully we have a few more joining us. So I'm going to jump right in and start answering the questions. I'm going to get through as many as I can in about 20 minutes or so. So stay with me and if you have to run, just know that I'll be posting the video and any relevant links that I mention during the live after the video, after the live is done. So let's start with the first one. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the first one is from Marg in Canada. When shooting candid photos in gathering places, summer events, and festivals, basically any public place, what tips do you have for photographing children? I notice that people are apprehensive and suspicious. Yes, that is very true, Mark, because people are very conscious of social media, um, where those images might go. So, rightly so, and generally anybody that has kids is sensitive to those issues. So if you want to photograph children and they are in a public place, the best way to go about it is to get the permission of the parents, whether that be verbally, go up and ask them, tell them what you have to want to do with the photos, and if they say yes, go ahead, and if they don't, respect their wishes, and don't take photos of their child. Um, it's, it's up to each parent of, I know some people personally that don't share any photos of their children online at all, so it's not your decision to share photos of their children. Um, if you don't speak the language, if you're traveling or something, you can also ask permission just by a head nod and pointing at your camera. And usually if they agree or disagree, they'll give you a, a signal physically, like a head nod or, or a no, please don't. So I do suggest getting the permission of the parents because it is such a sensitive issue and people can do things that are inappropriate. So make sure that if you're photographing children, you get permission and you don't do anything inappropriate. And unfortunately, it's even more important for men because as a female, we actually have a little bit of liberties where we're maybe not deemed as, as creepy as a man, unfortunately. And I'm not saying that's true or not true, um, but unfortunately as a man, you're going to have a harder time with this. You have to be even more careful when you're photographing children. Okay? So I hope that answers your question, Mark. The next question is from Neil in Scotland. So I hope Neil is watching or watches the playback later. And his question is, what exactly is bracketing? How would you use it and when? So bracketing is something that your camera can do for you. Uh, it will take a series of photos at different exposures. So for example, you might do one that's really dark, one medium, and one bright. So it might look like plus two, a zero, and minus two. Okay, so going from light to dark. And why you might do this is if you have a scene that has extremely high contrast, you might bracket taking in the full range of the scene. So your brightest image is going to capture details in the, in the shadows, and your darkest image is going to capture detail in the highlights. Then you can merge those together later using something like Merge to HDR in Lightroom, Photomatics, or McFun's Aurora HDR. I'll put a link um, afterwards in the reposting to an article that I did on using Lightroom's Merge to HDR and I walk through step by step how to bracket and how to process them in Lightroom and that should help you out as well. The next question, moving right along, is from Emmanuel in Nigeria. So I'm really excited to see so many people from all around the world um, reading my page and my website and I love how international our community has become. So his question is, how can I work in direct sunlight to get amazing portraits? Unfortunately, the short answer to that, Emmanuel, is really difficult, <laughs> or you cannot. You're working against the light in that situation because bright sunlight is very harsh. It's a hard light source, which means that it has a lot of contrast. It emphasizes texture, meaning any bump or imperfection, blemish, wrinkle um, of the skin of your subject is going to be emphasized. Not something that most people really want when they're having their portrait taken. So if you want to flatter your subject, you really want to get out of the sun. 
So most portrait photographers actually work at a time of day which is called golden hour and it happens just before sunset and just after sunrise if you're an early morning person. So if you can get out during those times of day, that's ideal for making portraits. The light is a bit softer, it's coming from a lower direction at the horizon as well. When you're shooting in midday, not only are you battling the harsh contrast of the sun, but also the direction of the light, being that it comes from directly overhead and you're going to get dark eye sockets in your subjects. So if you can't shoot at those times of day, try getting into the shade, uh, find a shady area of a tree or um, under a building or next to a building or on a porch, something like that so that you can get some shade and get more even light on your subject. It's very important to make sure that your background is also shady because if your background is bright and your subject is in the shade, your background is going to grab all the attention. Right? So if you want more information, I will share a link. I actually have an entire course on doing this kind of thing. It's called Portrait Fundamentals and I'll share a link to that as well after when I share the video. So I hope that helps answer your question. might not be the answer you're looking for, but the easiest way is to make your life a little bit, don't work so hard. Work smarter and not harder. Um, try and get either a different time of day or get into the shade. Okay. I see we have a few more people have joined in. We've got Sandy from Calgary in Alberta, Canada, and Barbie Lee. Hi guys, thanks for joining. So the next question comes all the way from Margie in Puerto Rico and I'm actually really excited to see so many Spanish speaking readers or from Spanish speaking countries and I'd like to give you a little teaser if you are a native Spanish speaker, um, it's coming probably within the next year or so we are going to be doing some articles in Spanish on Digital Photo Mentor and moving towards doing some more translations for you Spanish speakers. So look forward to that and keep following. So Margie's question is, how would you go about teaching a beginner the best and easiest way to understand and quickly learn the confusing handling of aperture, shutter speed, ISO, and white balance? So basically what she's, she's wanting to know is how to, to manage the exposure triangle. So the three things that make up the exposure triangle are what control the exposure on your picture, and that is the ISO, the shutter speed, and the aperture. So let me see if I can do a two minute um, explanation of the uh, exposure triangle for you that will help you understand it a little better and then I'll give you some links to some other articles on each of them so that you can get a better grasp. Okay, so let's start with the ISO. The ISO is the sensitivity of your camera's digital sensor to light. So you can raise the number up to a higher amount such as 1600 or 3200 when you're in a dark room to capture more of that light. Okay, so the first thing that I do in any situation is I set my ISO based on how much light is in the room. Here in this room in my office today, it's not very bright, I've got some lights on, so I probably set my ISO a little bit higher, maybe 800 or 1600. And if you have auto ISO on your camera and you're a beginner, feel free to use it. I recommend it in my classes as well. Okay, so the camera will choose for you. The second, two, the second and third piece of the exposure triangle are the aperture and the shutter speed. And I like to use a little analogy of um, a water tap and a glass of water to help explain them. So the aperture is the opening in your lens. It's like the pupil in your eye. So it opens really big to let in a lot of light when it's dark and you close it down really small when it's bright. Just like your eye and your pupil closes when you go out in the bright sun. Okay, the shutter speed is how long the curtain in your camera opens and closes to let light in. And combining those things together is how much light is it going to reach the sensor total. So let's use the tap analogy. So if you want to fill a glass of water, um, you can go to the tap and turn it on just a tiny little bit. So you get a trickle coming out, but what's going to happen is it's got a small opening in the tap and the glass is going to sit there for a really long time to collect a full glass of water. Okay, so small opening, long time. The same works in photography. If you have a small opening in the lens, the aperture, you're going to need a long shutter speed to get the correct exposure. Now if we do the opposite and we open the tap to a large opening, like your aperture, more water is coming through quickly, so therefore you're not going to need to hold the glass under the tap as long to get a full glass of water. Same thing is true in photography. So if you open your lens to the biggest setting and it's lots of light is coming through, you don't need a shutter speed that is as long. You're able to use a faster shutter speed. 
So how those things come together and how you decide which to use is depending on your subject. So I'll give you some more um, reading material for later on aperture and shutter speed that will help you understand the balance between the two because it's like a teeter-totter. If you change one, the other one has to change in order for you to keep a balance and maintain a good exposure. So I hope that's kind of a good base for you to understand the exposure triangle and I'll give you some more resources to continue learning. Okay, the next question comes from Tony in New Zealand, uh, one of my favorite places. So it's not really a question, Tony kind of makes a statement, but I'd like to comment it because he says, I shoot 100% manual with my 7D, 7D 700 camera, sorry, 7D 700 camera. In any other mode, I have to adjust up or down a few stops to correct the exposure. It's much easier in manual. So that kind of goes along with the last question that we talked about with the exposure triangle and setting the exposure for your camera is that when you're in manual, you have to control all three of those of the triangle, the ISO, the aperture, and the shutter speed. And if you are a beginner, that can be a bit overwhelming. So I know that many teachers will tell you that if you're not shooting in manual, you're not a real photographer. I've actually had people in my classes say that somebody told them that and I just don't agree with that because I feel that, especially as a beginner, you've just gotten a new camera, you're learning all the buttons and settings on the camera, now you have to know what they do and if you have to learn everything at once, it's too overwhelming and you risk actually wanting to give it up or throw your camera out the window. So don't do that. Don't throw your camera out the window. Um, what I suggest is manual has its place. I actually don't use manual that often. The only times that I use manual shooting mode personally is when my camera is on a tripod. So that means I have time to slow down, think about the scene I'm photographing, think about what I want to capture in that scene. Do I want a lot of depth of field, meaning I want a small aperture? Do I want to get a slow shutter speed, meaning I want to capture some motion or something entirely different? Do I want a bracket? So these are all things that we've already discussed. So when I'm on a tripod shooting, say, night photography or HDR and doing brackets, um, then I have the choice of shooting manual and, and consciously making a choice of all three of my settings. But when I'm doing, say, travel photography or street photography and I'm walking around hand holding the camera, most of the time, I would say 90% of the time, I'm using aperture priority mode. So what that means is I'm going to select the aperture that I want for my picture and how much depth of field or how much of the picture is in focus, the camera is going to select the shutter speed for me. And that allows me to work a little bit quicker and not think about the exposure so much and focus more on composition, lighting, and the material and the subject that is in the photograph, making sure that I create something that's interesting. Right? And you'll find that if you are a beginner, you'll start to think less about the settings the more you understand about them and more about the aesthetic parts of photography. But it's a process, so don't beat yourself up if you're not there yet. If you haven't mastered manual and you feel like it's, it's going to take forever, it doesn't take forever, but the more you use your camera, if you could use your camera every single day and learn what one button does, and tomorrow learn a different button, and the next day learn a different button or a different menu setting, you will know your camera better, and then from there you can start to learn what those things do and how it affects your pictures. So I'll share um, a link to a challenge that I had on the website probably about a year ago, which was to use your camera every day. And you can read in the comments what some people learned by doing that. They actually found that they didn't have to buy a new camera because their camera did everything they needed it to do, they just didn't know how to use it properly. So I will share that with you as well. Okay, and I think we have time for one, maybe two more questions. The next one comes from Sally in the US. And Sally asks, what camera settings do I need to get my white background white instead of ugly gray? Well, that's a trick question actually, Sally, because it's not a camera setting that you're going to need to make a white background. So for example, if you are indoors and you're doing a window light portrait in your living room and there's a white wall but it's quite some distance away from you and away from the window, you're never going to be able to make the white wall white and maintain a proper exposure on your subject without actually adding light to the wall. Because something is at play here which is called the inverse square law, which is a little bit complex and I'm not going to get into all of the science of how that works. But the short version is that the farther away you get from the window, the darker it is, right? Makes sense. So if you're near the window, it's brighter. If you're on the other side of the room, it's darker. So if you're trying to photograph somebody in a room and the window is not near the wall, um, the wall is not going to be getting any light. 
right? If you're in a studio environment, you have a light on your subject, but you don't have a light on the background, the background is not going to be white. So the best way to get a white background is to add light to it. So you're going to need one, ideally two flashes behind the subject pointing at the wall, pointing at the background in order to get it even. It's kind of tricky because it's really easy to overexpose and then you get the background glowing on your subject as well. So you have to really balance the exposure to get pure white and not overly bright, but the only way to get a white background is to light it. So I don't know if that's the answer you wanted either. There isn't really a simple way with camera settings. Unfortunately, you might need some more gear if you don't have an extra flash. Okay, I think we have time for one more quick one. And the last one we're gonna cover today is from Ruben from Puerto Rico. So two from Puerto Rico today, bienvenidos. So he asks, what is the best setting for bird photography? Please include spot metering and focus points. So bird photography is not my specialty, but it falls into the category of photographing moving targets. So whenever you're photographing a moving target, there's some settings that you want to adjust on your camera that are going to be better than if you're photographing a non-moving target. Okay, so the first thing you're gonna want is continuous burst mode on your camera. So what that means is when you press the button and hold it down, it takes several photos, right? It goes click, 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 instead of just one. So that gives you just a better chance of capturing the bird as opposed to trying to get one shot at a time. The next thing you wanna do is you wanna turn on continuous or focus tra uh, tracking focus. So on Nikon, that is AFC, I have to think about it for a second, and on Canon, that is the servo mode, so AI servo. And what that does is, instead of locking focus on the target, it's going to move. So if you have your focus point on the subject, but the subject is moving in distance towards you and away from you, the camera is going to track the focus on the moving subject and go with it. It's not going to lock. So if you're on single point or single mode focus, you want to change that so that it tracks the moving subject. The last thing you want to change is instead of using a single dot focus, which I recommend for, for non-moving subjects most of the time, you want to go to a multi-point or a zone focus. So what that means is in your camera you have different dots where your camera focuses, so change it to one where many of them are activated or all of them. So then the camera is going to choose which point to focus on. It's almost impossible to get a single dot on a moving target, especially a bird, because they can go in any direction. At least a person running down the street can only go left or right. They can't go up or down. So choose a multi or, or a full-on zone focus points. So those are the settings that I would recommend for bird photography. You also want to make sure that you have a fairly fast shutter speed. Um, again, you want to combat not only camera shake from holding your camera, if you're using a long lens, you're also going to be combating the weight of the lens, but the bird itself is moving. So generally for bird photography, you're going to want at least a 500th of a second, probably faster, because those guys move really fast. Um, I have some articles on focus point and achieving focus and sharper images I will share with you after the post is saved. So I think that's all time we have for today. And I would like to thank you for joining in and submitting your question. If I didn't get your question today, I'm hoping to do this on a more regular basis. This is just the first of many. So um, I will let you know when the next one is going to be and you can join in. Please remember to submit your questions. And if I don't get to it in the next one, I will save it for future Facebook Lives. Thanks for joining in and we'll see you online. Take care.